just because they're so good. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, yes, you are. Church, it is a blessing to be able to open God's Word this morning. My name is Andrew. I'm the minister at St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church, and um, we're beginning a new series on the Book of Ruth for the next four weeks, and we're going to be looking at God's providence. I invite you to journey with us as we look at this text together. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, uh, we welcome you, and we'd love to see you at physical church. And so you can join our physical church at 26 Norwood Street at 10 a.m. every Sunday. Uh, we'd love to see you there. The Book of Ruth, chapter 1. This is God's Word. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrates, um, Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and returned there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took, these took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Marlon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I... Yet sons in my wombs, that they may become your husbands. Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley season. Amen. That was God's word. Let us pray. Our God, our Father, we do need your help right now as we listen online. Father, wherever we are, please open our eyes to see the beauty of your truth. Open our ears, enable us to hear your word clearly preached and understood. Father, change our hearts, soften it so that we may turn to you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth chapter 1, God's providence in the ordinary. Uh, This morning, you might feel like you live a pretty ordinary life. Maybe you wished you lived an extraordinary life. Uh, Maybe you wished God would perform extravagant miracles after miracles in your life. Uh, Do you know this morning, in your possibly ordinary life, God is at work. In your ordinary life, God is at work. I believe 100% that God has a plan and purpose for your life, for your ordinary life, even a plan and purpose for your sufferings and pains that might come your way. And so this morning, you might think, well, nothing's really happening. Maybe this morning, you're getting uh, tragedies after tragedies and you're just wondering, is God really doing something? Let me assure you this morning, God is sovereignly in control of your life, your pains and sufferings, the ups and downs, and He is doing something incredible, something extraordinary. Uh, What's interesting about our story this morning is that this is a story of an ordinary family, family, an ordinary woman with, to be honest, an ordinary life. Life filled with pains and agonies, life in a world of sin, life made up of all sorts of mistakes and decisions, and you'll see she makes lots of mistakes and decisions. Life like a roller coaster with its ups and downs. Uh, This is the life of Naomi, and how God is going to bring her from emptiness to fullness through Ruth. In the next four sermons, we're going to see God's providence, meaning God's provision and sovereignty over the life of Naomi and Ruth. Uh, Today, we're going to see God's providence in the ordinary. We're going to look at the context of the book of Ruth. Uh, We're going to spend a bit of time there because it's very important to get the context. Uh, It's going to lay out the next few sermons. And then I want to look at uh, the three characters, at least three characters in our story. We're going to look at Naomi, Ruth, and then God. So context, the Naomi, Ruth, and God. Uh, the firstly, the context, if you open your Bibles, if you look at the first five verses of this chapter, it gives us the context of our passage. Uh, verse one says this, doesn't it? In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And so in the situation, there's a famine, no food or water. Uh, But this story not only uh, takes place in a famine, but it also takes place during the time of Judges. And so if you turn your Bibles one page back, the book of Judges comes right before the book of Ruth in our English Bibles. And the very last verse tells us something very interesting. It tells us something very interesting about the context, the culture of that time. Judges 21, 25 says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, in his own eyes. It's a very dark time in Israel history. Now you might be thinking that's a good thing when it says, says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, but that is a bad statement. It's a bad thing. You see, people thought they were the boss. Uh, When you read through the book of Judges, 21 chapters of the book of Judges, you'll see God's people sinning, 
God judging them. God's people crying out and God restoring and rescuing them. But they would always, always, always go back to sinning, rebelling against God again and again. God's people would do what was right in their own eyes instead of looking to God, their king. And so we're in a sinful period and desperate times. And we're introduced to a man, right? And his wife and two sons. Naomi, Elimelech, her husband, her two sons, Marlon and Chilion. It tells us in verse 1, they moved to Moab, uh, which they shouldn't have. They left the promised land to go to a pagan nation. They had traveled to a pagan land with foreign gods. They took matters to their own hands. Uh, things couldn't go, get worse, go worse. Look at verse 3. Elimelech dies. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she, is, she was left with her two sons. And in verse 5, it tells us that both Marlon, the, um, verse 4, that both Marlon and Chilion took Moabite wives. Now moving to Moab and taking Moabite wives should shock us. And so now we're going to look at a few things about Moabites. Now the first thing I want you to notice um, or know is that Moabites came from incest relationships. If you go back to Genesis 19, we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? A sinful city and God judges them. In God's goodness and grace, he saves Lot and his wife and two, uh, two daughters. Uh, but his wife looks back, she dies. At the end of the chapter, it tells us that Lot's daughter daughters get Lot drunk. And they sleep with their father. And they get pregnant. It tells us in Genesis 19.37 that the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And so Moabites have a sinful origin, daughter sleeping with her father. And when you trace through the Old Testament, you can see the headache the Moabites give to God's people. Uh, Moab led Israel into pagan worship, Baal worship on its way to Canaan. Uh, Numbers 25 tells us that um, Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord kindled against them. The Moabites seduced the Israelites into idolatry. If you remember the story of Balaam and um, the donkey, his donkey, uh, the context of Numbers 22 is that the Moabites hired Balaam to curse Israel as they journeyed towards the promised land. Uh, there's so much more to say about the Moabites, but they were not in good terms with God's people. Uh, so what we have here is Naomi's son, Mary. Sons marry Moabite women, and then in Ruth chapter 1, verse 5, it tells us the sons, her sons die. And so can you feel the sadness and sorrow of this introduction? A famine, and leaving the promised land to a pagan foreign land with pagan foreign gods, death of her husband, marriage of sons to Moabite women, enemies, and death of her sons. A tragedy after tragedy. If you notice at verse 5, the author doesn't call Naomi, Naomi, but calls her the woman, as if she has lost her identity. She has lost her identity. Now you might think this is an extraordinary situation, but life often looks like Naomi's life, doesn't it? Bad things happen to us. Things go out of our control. Uh, we all have a choice to either trust God or to lean and to lean on Him or to reject Him and to be bitter and to live life our way, to take things into our control. We have, a cho we have a choice to trust God in our circumstances or to live life doing what is right in our own eyes, especially in the times of the COVID-19 pandemic people getting sick, lives being lost, jobs being cut. It's a very normal thing in our sinful, broken world. It's not that extraordinary. 
And so this is an ordinary family and an ordinary woman. And that's our context uh, for our book and our passage today. So now I want you to follow the story with me. Oh, we're going to go very quickly, and we're going to look at the three characters very briefly. What happens? Look at verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law in, to return from the country of Moab, for she has heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord has visited, had visited his people and given them food. And so we're looking at Naomi right now. Verse 6 tells us that there is now food back in Bethlehem because of God. Naomi is going to return home. And from verses 16 to 14, if you look through it, Naomi encourages her daughter-in-laws to go stay in Moab and to live their own life. She's encouraging her daughter-in-laws to not follow her back to Bethlehem. Uh, Twice she encourages them to stay in Moab. The second time in verses 13, it says this, Know my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. You see, verse 13 gives us insight on Naomi's feelings and thought process. And Naomi has made it very clear. In her eyes, Naomi believes that Yahweh has attacked her as her enemy. Her earlier tragedies, her famine, exile, loss of husband, sons, all were from God. It was only the beginning. And from her perspective, if Orpah and Ruth were to follow her, they would only suffer as well. And later in verse 19 onwards, when she gets to Bethlehem, she changes her name to Mara. Verses 20 to 21, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Uh, Do you see how bitter Naomi is? Uh, The name Naomi comes from the word, root word, lovely or pleasant. But now she has changed her name to Mawa, reflecting bitterness in her feelings. She's angry at God and her situation. She recognizes that God is sovereignly in control of her situation or her tragedies. She rightly recognizes that God has brought to her everything that's happened to her. She repeats and emphasizes God's dealings with her. But sadly, she wrongly understands the situation. She doesn't trust God in the midst of suffering. It's not wrong to lament and to cry out to God. It's not wrong to ask God why. But it's wrong to accuse God and attack God for who He is. You see, Naomi is blinded by her sin and bitterness that she can't see God's loving kindness towards her. Naomi is blinded by her sin and bitterness that she can't see God's loving kindness towards her. Or maybe today you can empathize with Naomi. You can feel and share her pain. And maybe you're in a similar situation today. Tragedy after tragedy, pain after pain. And it doesn't seem to get any better. Maybe your situation isn't that bad. But life isn't going your way. And you take things in your own hands. You follow the way, world way of thinking and doing things instead of trusting God and searching His Word and, pray and, and coming to Him in prayer. You know, it's very often, to, it's very, often very easy uh, to, get, to be bitter against God and being blinded by our own sin. And it's very easy for us not to see God's gracious hand on us. And so that's Naomi, bitter Naomi. I want to draw your attention to now to Ruth, because Ruth stands in great contrast with Naomi. Uh, Ruth's character is sandwiched between Naomi's complaints. Uh, we see Naomi's character in verses 6 to 14 and 19 and 22. And in the middle, we see Ruth's beauty shine. How does Ruth respond to Naomi's bitterness? Verses 16 to 17. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts from you. Wow. Remember, this is a Moabite woman. Ruth is a Moabite woman. She has no dealings with God's people and place. There's no reason for her to stay with Naomi. Naomi's made plain to her that she can go back to her mother's house, remarry, start a new life. And if she comes with her, she can't provide anything. There's no obligation to Naomi. She's an outsider. Unlike Orpah, she shows incredible devotion and commitment, not only to Naomi, but to God. Did you hear it? Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. May the Lord do so to me more also if anything but death parts me from you. You see, Naomi, uh, Ruth calls upon God's covenant name, Yahweh. In the midst of a broken situation, in the midst of pain and suffering, in the midst of the uncertainties of the future, we see God use a broken, ordinary family, right? This is a broken, ordinary family to bring a Moabite woman to himself. God saves Ruth. Ruth demonstrates faith. And Naomi didn't do a great evangelistic work. But God did a miracle in saving Ruth in an ordinary situation. But not only that, Ruth demonstrates loving kindness in a similar way to God. Verse 8, we see Naomi's perspectives of the sisters. She says this about the sisters. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The word kindly in this particular passage is the special Old Testament word chesed, God's covenant faithfulness, loving kindness. You hear me mention this Hebrew word a lot because the Old Testament um, uses this word as a key word to understand who God is. Uh, Some Bibles translate it as the steadfast love. Uh, We read, uh, if you go to uh, the famous text in Exodus, where it gives a description of who God is. God reveals himself um, to Abraham. And to Moses. And what Naomi does, Sorry, into, she, he, what God reveals to himself to Moses. And what Naomi does is she re- attributes their loving kindness towards her in the same way that she wants God to deal with them. And so Ruth stands in great contrast as a woman who demonstrates love and kindness and grace. An ordinary woman transformed by God's grace. Uh, before we move on to God, uh, one thing about Naomi and Ruth is that Naomi can't see God's kassen. She can't see God's loving kindness towards her. She can only see Ruth's loving kindness and loyalty. And it's as if she's making a statement that God has failed her in kassen, but Ruth and Orpah hasn't. God has failed Naomi in kassen. That's why she's bitter against God. She can't see God's loving kindness. And that draws our attention to our final character. I want to look at this very briefly. God. You see, Naomi missed the point. She missed the mark. She couldn't see God's goodness and grace. You see, God is steadfast in love. His mercies are new every day. Yet all Naomi could see was bitterness and anger against God. She couldn't see God's hand at work in a good way. She downplayed God's provision in Bethlehem. It tells us in verse 6 that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she knew it was God who provided, yet she didn't rejoice in the fact. In verse 9, she prays that Yahweh would give uh, rest to her daughter-in-laws. Yahweh is the giver of rest. But she didn't find rest in Yahweh herself. She was downcast in her situation. 
She couldn't see the joy that there is in the faithfulness and loyalty of Ruth. She couldn't see that it was God who provided Ruth for her. She couldn't rejoice in her. and She couldn't rejoice in the faith of Ruth and her willingness to follow Yahweh. I know God provided Ruth for Naomi. Because if you turn your, um, your, the, your Bible to the end of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 4, verses 14 to 17, we see a picture. We see a picture of God's goodness to Naomi. Uh, Ruth has given birth. And the women surrounding Naomi say to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day. It goes on later to say um, that your that her daughter-in-law Ruth um, is more valuable than seven sons, and she has given birth to him. They later say that uh, the wo- the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, "A son has been born to Naomi." In ancient Near Eastern culture, sons are incredibly wor- valuable. But Ruth is far more valuable from their perspective than even seven sons. And notice it's the Lord who provided Ruth a baby to give to Naomi. Verse 17, a son has been born to Naomi. And so by the end of the book, you see from emptiness to fullness. God has been good to Naomi, providing Ruth to her. And in his provision, he has uh, saved her from her pain and suffering. If there's, something that, uh, if there's something this text teaches us, it is this, that God is steadfast in love. He's indeed sovereign over the ordinary lives of ordinary people, and He can do extraordinary things in our ordinary and somewhat mundane lives. Ruth the Moabite turns to God, Naomi begins her pathway, return to God. God sovereignly provides the barley harvest season at the end of chapter 1. God sovereignly uses this broken family to bring the coming of King David, who in turn brings the coming of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, King Jesus, who saves sinners, the one who provides perfect rest. And so I don't know what you may be struggling with right now, I don't know what situation you are in or what situation you might face in the future. Whatever it is, wherever you are, run to God. Run to the cross. Run to Jesus. If you're struggling in sin and maybe you, maybe you have done things that you shouldn't have done, run. Return to Jesus. Uh, the word return is used 12 times in this chapter. You can't really see it that well because it's not translated well in our English Bibles. But surely that's an important purpose, an important theme about returning to God. Naomi was to return to God. Return to the cross in your sin. Return to Jesus. And when you are blinded and unable to see God's loving kindness, look to the cross. Remember that God has given you his son already. Romans 8 35 will end with this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Look to the cross in your pain and suffering. See how God provides brothers and sisters in Christ, family and friends as a means of his kindness towards you. Amen. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you so much for the first chapter of the book of Ruth. There's so much more to say about this passage, Father, but um, in the time that we were able to have together, Lord, we're thankful that you have shown us your providential care towards Naomi and Ruth and ultimately to us. Help us to trust you day after day, week after week, tragedies after tragedies. Help us to look to Jesus, the perfect giver of rest, the one who saves our souls. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The King of Love, my shepherd,
See? 